We live in the age of modern technology, a society that is virtually dominated by wireless internet, wireless phones, and wireless computers. Not a day goes by where you can't find someone making a phone call, surfing the web, or streaming the latest TV show. Perhaps the credit as to why we are so technologically driven in society today is due to the grandfather of the internet age, the radio. Amateur radio is the use of designated radio frequency spectra for purposes of private recreation, non-commercial exchange of messages, wireless experimentation, self-training, and emergency communication. John E. Moore is an example of an amateur radio operator. He had years of experience with both amateur and commercial radio operations. He attended Spex Howard School of Digital Media Arts and interned at the WNIC radio station of Detroit, Michigan. While growing up, the concept of amateur radio was fascinating to him. In uh, early 1976, uh, just before I went into my freshman year of uh, high school, um, I decided that I wanted to finally become an amateur radio operator, so I learned Morse code, international Morse code. And uh, there's theory that goes along with that uh, exam for the novice class license. Um, and I passed it the first time with flying colors, was licensed as WD8AXF. So having been in amateur radio for a number of years and talking to people all over the world, I thought uh, it would be kind of a neat thing to uh, be in commercial radio. Um, I was listening to uh, WNIC out of Detroit for the longest time. and. It was my favorite radio station. Um, I'd listen in, listen to the uh, the jocks in the morning, and um, you know, I thought, hey, that is an awesomely cool job. John E. Moore's father, John W. Moore, is a veteran of the United States Army and is another licensed amateur radio operator himself. I had a first license in 1959, so uh, what's that? In 2019, it'll be 60 years. Something like that. A long time. In the old in the old structure, I held the advanced uh, um, ex extra class license, amateur extra class license. And back then, you had to go from novice, which is just an entry level, to technician, which is next step up, to general. They had an advanced class and the extra class, and I went through all of those. Uh, I operate 75 meters, uh, 40 meters, and sometimes 20 meters. I have wire antennas that I can do that. The uh, 75 meter band is mostly uh, regional during the daytime. Okay. At night it lengthens out and you can work overseas and so forth. Not 40 meters, a little bit uh, different. Uh, you can work regionally. Mexico, Canada, and stuff like that. And then at night it does also lengthen out to where you can operate overseas. And 20 meters is the big band that if you want to work foreign countries like Israel or Antarctica or, or like that, and then 20 meters is the band to get on and uh, so forth. So, And uh, I operate all of those. So. This is a transceiver. And it will cover all of those bands, so it's uh, it's a multiple use radio. Interesting thing is, this is this is all a hardware radio. It's got hardware, nothing to do. The newer radios now are called soft software design radios. You don't have any of that. Hook it up to the computer, and you can tune. It'll do everything that this will do, but you're doing it with a computer. Well, they're both reliable. This is more modern. It, uh, you can reprogram this to do a lot of things where, uh, where on this radio you can't do that because it's fixed. It's got fixed components in it. You, you can't change it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, when, when you bought it to do a specific function, that's all you can do. Right. But if you have this radio and something new comes out, they just send you some new software. And you plug it into your computer and it reassembles this up here. So. This is more modern type of radio. Together they shared stories of their experiences with amateur radio. 
But I never thought of that in 1959. Oh, no. 1959, we built most of our radios. So that was uh, one of the things we did. Uh, I built my first... uh, I built my first transmitter and uh, been building ever since. Sometimes kits, sometimes right from scratch, you know. Get a bunch of components, put them together, and go from there. You had your radio. Yeah, (laughs) sure. But uh, not like that anymore. And back in the early days, there were 10 call sign districts in the United States, one through zero, and zero being the 10. So New England, for example, is the first call district. Michigan is the eighth call district. And uh, I was first licensed in Maine, so I have a call sign that's got a one in it, K1DE. So, and that's how they they issue those. Um, My call is WAJWQ, and I'm a general class licensee. Uh, My dad, who was actually my Elmer, as well as my father for all of these years, was the person who got me interested in amateur radio right from uh, when I was uh, very little. Um, so I, I hold a general class license, but uh, if, say, my dad, who is an amateur extra, is talking to somebody in the amateur extra frequency, um, I have the ability to be able to talk to that person as long as he is present as the control operator in the room. Um, I can use my call sign, uh, uh, this is K1DE with W8JWQ at the mic. That's perfectly legal in FCC terms, um, and you know that's the way that the FCC rules require that you uh, handle things. Now if I were to get on his frequency without him being here, then it, it would be illegal. Um, but. Uh, typically, you know, uh, if Dad were here as the control operator, um, then uh, I would be able to, um, you know, handle those frequencies because he's right here making sure that I'm following all the rules that, you know, pertain to his class. Since first invented, amateur radio technology has advanced greatly over the years. Amateur radio goes a long way back, a long ways. You know, it's uh, back in the late uh, 19, oh, 20s or so, probably even more than that, and uh, the technology there was uh, crude as far as uh, transmitting and so forth, uh, but then mostly it was Morse code. Morse code was the big thing back then because it was easy to build transmitters for that and easy to uh, receive it. and. Experimental stations were set up, uh, one in Massachusetts, and they, lo and behold, they contacted somebody in England, and that was the first long, what they call DX, or distance station, and that was that was way back when. And since then, you know, the technology has advanced. Uh, you get more, uh, mostly in the early 30s, 40s, everything was vacuum tubes, tube radios, and... Uh, and people built their own, generally. Um, Collins Radio was very big in the 40s because they provided all of the, most of the radios for the uh, military. They were very rugged radios, but they were all vacuum tube type radios. They, uh, so they were big, cumbersome, because that's the way it was. All the components in those radios were big. And then as the late 50s moved towards us, the semiconductors, the integrated circuits and things like that are being developed where you could take a whole radio and put it on a microchip and so radios got smaller and um, you know some of those old radios were two, three hundred and fifty volts. You had to watch that or you'd get shot you know with those. But <clears throat> Then came along the microchips and stuff and the radios were built at 12 volts no need to get shocked on those mm-hmm. because they they work pretty good. So and then it just keeps evolving with things getting smaller and smaller and more integration, more circuits were getting, were smaller. So the radios were smaller, but they did the same job. And uh, and there here we are, you know. Uh, this radio probably now is obsolete. There's probably other radios that are are smaller. 
and so forth, but they still, they still do the same job. So. Skywarn pertains to the network of amateur radio operators who use their frequencies to report natural disasters, such as tornadoes and hailstorms, to the National Weather Service. Usually, when um, if if there's a severe thunderstorm watch, um, the the system, at least as I recall it, um, would be activated, and there were amateur radio operators that would go out into the field in specific designated areas and. Uh, keep an eye out. Um, they, they would have their specific locations logged by uh, whoever the operator was at the National Weather Service office and they would coordinate those reports from there. Uh, whether they see a wall cloud or a funnel cloud, um, you know, uh, hail is, uh, is a huge part. Um, uh, winds also um, is, uh, is a pretty big thing. Um, and they'll coordinate all those reports uh, with, via their radios to the National Weather Service office uh, with the operator there. And uh, they give the, um, the forecasters there that information and, um, you know, they issue uh, warnings um, as needed from there. I mean, for an amateur radio operator, typically they um, will go through a Skywarn spotter class, which uh, any local amateur radio club can help coordinate. Um, uh, National Weather Service I think does that sometimes uh, as well. Um, any of the several um, weather radio offices around the country. Um, and I'm not sure how long the classes are now. I think it was a couple of times back when I was originally certified but um, they just show you um, how thunderstorms form, um, what kind of clouds to look for, rotation um, and uh, the procedures on how to call it in. Um. For many operators, the topic of amateur radio brings up personal life stories of years past. I went with Bob Balmer and uh, um, Al Duncan, Al Duncan yep. 32 straight years to date. Started in 1972 and just kept on going. So we loved it. Every year we'd go down there and have a good time. They did too. <laughs> we'd swap and swindle, as they say. <laughs> and though modern technology may seem to be replacing amateur radio, many people still take pride in their operations. Some, some people like contests, you know, where they can talk to people around the world. Uh, other people just like the what we call rag chew, and that's just social social. Yeah, talking back and forth just for a long and time. <laughs> and then you get somebody like me that likes the technical part of it to build build antennas, build radios, and stuff like that. Don't need to talk as much, but I do like to build things and then maybe talk a little bit about it. But uh, there are contests going on, so a lot of things you can do still with amateur radio. People say that you know the cell phones and all the new technology is killing amateur radio, but if you listen across the band, there's still an awful lot of ham radio operators on, so. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah.